Watching the Tudors, part of the Agora Podcast Network. I'm Heather. I'm Jonathan. And this is the podcast where we watch the Tudors and go into depth on the history and background of the show and essentially look at the stories behind the drama. You can learn more about the show and about us at watchingthetutors.com. And that's actually a page on the Renaissance English History Podcast, which is the other podcast that I have that I've done since 2009. So this is season two, episode three, Checkmate. A quick reminder that if you like this show and you want to see more of it, please give us a rating on iTunes. It really helps. It's the number one way you can help a show succeed because it helps other people find the program. So... What do we want to talk about for this episode? It was full of, oh, our spoiler alert. Yeah, just we're going to mention things about the future. I mean, obviously, we're going to talk about the show. Um, So if you haven't seen the show, you know, you might want to watch this episode. And we're also just going to talk in general about things that may happen in the future. Yeah, like Anne Boleyn dies. Yeah, So you didn't know. Now (laughs) you do. So in this episode, Anne Anne becomes queen and she gives birth to a baby. But Girl. it's not a boy. Yeah. Oh, Oops. tragedy. Um, God's judgment came raining down. So <laughs> With the healthy, sweet little girl. Yeah. Who, the irony is, became the greatest monarch England ever had. You want to start asking me your questions? Sure. Okay. Um, so it started off with a pretty shocking scene of the Brandon guy mm-hmm. uh, getting killed in a yes. church. Like, is there yeah. any truth to, like, any of that? Did a, one of Boleyn's henchmen kill one of Brandon's henchmen? Okay, so we had talked a little bit before about the relationship between Brandon and Anne being strained. Mm-hmm. And one thing that's ro- kind of wrong, not kind of wrong, but is wrong in this show, Brandon's wife, Henry's sister, hadn't died yet at this point. So he wasn't married to this Catherine Willoughby person yet, yeah. his ward. Um, and Mary was very much against Anne Boleyn because she was a queen. She was royalty. She saw Catherine as being royalty. You know, she would support Catherine and she was very public about it. The other thing that led to this kind of feud that they had was the Duke of Suffolk, Brandon, had some, had some beef with the Duke of Norfolk, who was the, the Howard family, who was part of mm, Anne's family. Yeah. So as Anne was rising, there kind of was some beef. So in 1532... Something did happen. There was a quarrel between some of the Duke of Norfolk's men and some of Brandon's men. Mm -hmm. And one of them actually did go into Westminster Abbey, I think, and was um, tried to claim sanctuary, didn't work out. And there was a murder that was committed. And then the murders were pardoned. And it and it just kind of added to the messiness. And that would happen in 1532. So I think that's what that would be referring to. Yeah. Interesting. It was, yeah. And it said, basically, the record, the person who recorded it said, um, at the moment of his arrival at court, one of the chief gentlemen in the service of the said Duke of Norfolk with 20 followers assaulted and killed in the sanctuary of Westminster, this other person, chief gentleman and kinsman of the Duke of Suffolk. So he really did kill him in a church. That's Mm -hmm. wild. Yeah. Wow. And then it was pardoned. So, yeah. yeah. No big deal. And then I was surprised. I mean, I guess you had talked about how Henry, you know, kind of remained loyal to the church while completely splitting from it. But Mm -hmm. I was surprised when Henry said he wanted to have the marriage approved by the Archbishop of Canterbury and like everything like that. Well, he always thought that he had the legal standing with this and that Mm -hmm. it was right so yes yeah yeah and then did cram cranmer Uh uh-huh he had a secret wife (laughs) he totally did do you think he shipped her in a box well you know where that comes from actually so he did her name was marguerite he did have a wife he did have he did have a wife and he met her in germany and when he was in nuremberg And where that comes from, apparently, is that there was a fire in his house. And they said that um, there was one of the all of his belongings got ruined, got destroyed. But one of the things that was saved was a box that was owned by the archbishop and the contents within were was unknown. And this apparently turned into a story 
that was repeated by Roman Catholics during the reigns of Mary and Elizabeth that she was hiding in the box. In the box, yeah. And so then it turned into this whole story that um, he carted her around the country <laughs> in, her in a box. box. Yeah. And in reality, actually, it was it was quite sad. They were very deeply in love. And at first, he thought, being a Protestant, that he could arrange that the priests were able to marry, that they didn't have to be celibate. And then as it got clearer and clearer that Henry wasn't going to go in that direction, that Henry still believed in the celibacy of priests, Cranmer realized that his secret relationship was going to get, get a lot of trouble, getting a lot of trouble. And so she left, and they were separated. And then after... Henry died and Prince Edward became king and he was Protestant. He actually brought her back and they were able to live openly. And it was very quite, it was, you know, really sweet. They'd been together for years and years, but never able to live as man and wife yeah. openly. And um, then Edward died and then Mary um, went hardcore, went the, hardcore other the other way and he got killed soon anyway after that. So uh, anyway, I, one thing that's really interesting is that I think is quite sweet of this is that in the Book of Common Prayer that he wrote, it was the first time that the marriage vows that we know mm -hmm. were written down, and it's to have and to hold for better, for worse, richer, poor, in sickness and health, to love and to cherish until death do us part. It never said anything like that before. The vows weren't written like that. So Cranmer was, you know, they say he was deeply in love with his wife. And, and then next, there was the Pope signing papers, taking care of paperwork. Yeah. And just was like the enslavement of the native peoples of America thing mm -hmm. or like not non enslavement. Yeah. Know, like that was a, a real paper that he had really signed. Yeah. That was a, uh, it's called the sublimis, sublimis Deus and which stands for or means in Latin, the sublime God. And it was from 1537. So it's a little bit later, yeah. four years later than this which forbids the enslavement of indigenous people of the Americas called Indians of the West and the South and all other people. It was a real thing. Yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of them to, to grant. Yeah, what he says is he unequivocally declares the indigenous people of the Americas to be rational beings with souls, denouncing any idea to the contrary as directly inspired by the enemy of the human race. Wow. And he goes on to condemn slavery in the strongest terms, and said it's null and void for people that they could enslave people like that. So, yeah. Nice. Nice of, nice of him. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, so, and then also, then the Pope was going to sign the paper that said that um, Cranmer would become the Archbishop of Canterbury. Yes. And, like, he really signed off on that? He did. Interesting. Like, little did he know... <laughs> what this yeah. guy was going to get. I don't into. know. I haven't read that much about what his thinking would have been behind it, but I, I'm not yeah. sure what he thought, but he, he was approved as the Archbishop yeah. of Canterbury. Um, and then the King, like it's just becoming clear, all of it like being set up, like, you know, so he appointed Cranmer to be the sympathetic Archbishop who was going to, you know, do what do what he said. Cause you know, he was really so Protestant. Yes. Oh, just such a big plot. And then at the same time, Cromwell becomes chancellor. Like, was that the same time? Did that happen at the same time as all this other stuff was happening? Yeah. Cromwell was appointed chancellor in early 1533. So it was right around the marriage. And then Henry and Anne get married in secret in they a catacomb. They sure do. Like, in that, like, they seriously did that. Like... To me, like, all of this is just, gosh, it's just crazy. What big kind of things Henry did. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure there had been other kings in the past that had multiple wives. Well, that, his like, his grant, not, it's not multiple wives, but his grandfather, Edward IV, married Elizabeth Woodville in secret. Uh-huh. In, like, a farmhouse or something. No, I think they found a church. I don't yeah. know the whole story. But, yeah, so that had been done before. It's just wild. And then, you know what's crazy about uh -huh. Edward IV? Uh -huh. This is Henry's maternal grandfather. His chief chancellor at the time, Warwick, was negotiating a, a marriage for him with a princess in France. 
Yeah. And like they're wrapping up negotiations and all of it. And Warwick's like in France taking care of everything. And Edward's like, yeah, that's cool. And then like suddenly it comes out. He's like, oh, I got to tell you, I actually got married to this commoner Elizabeth Woodville chick that I just met on the road. And like I married her. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. All right. So the the Archbishop of Canterbury. Yes. Held like uh, whatever, a meeting or something. Uh-huh. And who who were all the guys in red, like the cardinals or whatever? I mean, are, were they all the old? Yeah, they were just the people. Like, you remember, the guys who like were there before? Yeah, and the submission of the clergy and stuff. Yeah. So they were all the people. So they're who, just kind of going along with all this. Exactly. I mean, as opposed to Moore, Thomas Moore, who's just like not accepting. And Thomas Moore wasn't clergy, but like Bishop no, I Fisher. know, but still, yeah. he wasn't. He wasn't in it. Yeah. Into it. So the guy who was supposed to kill Anne Boleyn tells the the. Spanish guy he was didn't do it and then goes to the Pope and wants to stay there. Yes. And he becomes like recruited into this ecclesiastical order. Of, yeah, the uh, Jesuits. And so that's this is like a real This is the Society of Jesus. It was uh founded later, so we're looking at fifteen forty. Mm-hmm. And it was set up in the manner of a a military kind of group. So there were ranks and they saw themselves as very militant. And later on during the reign of Elizabeth, the Jesuits would become very important because they were sneaking back into England and doing this really kind of, they, they were really, even though it was a Protestant country, they they were doing a lot of um, the illegal masses and uh-huh. they really saw themselves, they, they had a really important role in Elizabethan time for Catholics. Yeah. So this is a little early to have brought that in. They weren't founded yet mm-hmm. at this point, but that's who the Jesuits were. And later on in English history, they, they were very important. And were they ever like kind of violent like that? Like They did see themselves as warriors for God. Yeah. And they knew they were potentially going to martyrdom. And they, there were Jesuit ministry or there were Jesuit schools that people would go to. And when they left, they would be sent back to England knowing that they were likely going to be martyred for it. Wow. Yeah. And then Anne was really pregnant through like all of this. I mean, that, that timing lined up. Yeah. She, they got married in January and she gave birth in early September. So she probably got pregnant in like December. Yeah. They're like, all right, now we need to get married. Well, even then, I mean, people you wouldn't just miss one course before she probably wouldn't okay. have even told him that she was pregnant yet. Oh. By that point, okay. you you would wait until the quickening, okay, which was around 20 weeks to confirm it. But yeah, they probably knew. I mean, they'd started sleeping together. Yeah. They, they knew that the chances were quite, and plus, you know, he felt so certain that he was going to get a son from her. As soon mm-hmm. as he started sleeping with her, it was like, bam, kid. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, he wanted to make sure that since they had started sleeping together and there was a chance he, he might not have known that she was actually pregnant. She probably didn't even know that she was pregnant by that point, yeah. but uh, they would have known there was a chance. And then did he, the king, yes, really crown Anne? No. So this whole thing was wrong in so many ways. <laughs> To start with, the the processions would not have included him with her. The whole idea of the par- of the parades, she would have spent the night before in the tower in the Queen's apartments and then been paraded through to Westminster. And she would have been by herself with her ladies. But the king, the whole idea was to have all the focus be strictly on him. So, or uh, sorry, on her. So when she was crowned, he actually would have been watching in a separate little room where nobody could see him and like with a a screen up kind Mm -hmm. of thing. And so, no, he did not crown her. And it wasn't, it, it, it wasn't like, like that at all so no also there was no assassination attempt on her life Uh while they were having the parade (laughs) yeah um i I figured i didn't even write that down because i figured that was made up yeah Um, and it there was talk of how the crowds were not that into it and there weren't that many crowds also people did laugh and people jeered oh no and people made you know what people did was they saw that when you put together Henry and Anne's initials, it says ha. So they said, ha, 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 ha. And were laughing at it and making a joke of the fact. Yeah. yeah. So that that part was true that there weren't that many people and they seemed very disrespectful. And it wasn't just that they didn't. I, I think in the in the show, she said, you know, they didn't remove their hats. Yeah. They were a lot more disrespectful than not. Yeah, than, than not removing their hats. Yeah. And- but, you know, the other thing about 
coronation ceremonies like this would have been that they were huge events for people. You know, you d- this is a place where there's not weekends. People don't get yeah. days off, yeah. right? So this would have been a day off, a holiday. And they had all the conduits flowing with wine, free wine for everybody. Uh-huh. And so it was really this kind of designed to be this really festive atmosphere. There would be pageants at every couple of blocks, you know, every couple yeah. of streets you went, they would put on a pageant that was somehow evoking some kind of a, a symbolic something. And, you know, people were drinking wine out of the conduits. They were, ju- it was just flowing all day. They had the day off work and London was, you know, all decorated. Everything was very pretty. So it was designed to be a really festive atmosphere and like a party. So people would have been happy for that. And I don't know that they particularly would have cared that much about Anne, but there clearly wasn't that much respect for her. Yeah. But I don't know that they would have, it, you know, I think there might have been more crowds and people just out enjoying the free drink and free sunshine. Booze. It was June. Yeah. It was a nice day. And then what Anne, so then was like talking to her servants and being pretty like rigid about the church, you know, going to church and stuff. Yeah. Like what, was she like that? I mean, uh-huh. was she like, like yeah. kind of serious and... She did. I, you know, I think that she saw this as her opportunity to make her mark, which was going to be that she was going to be the almost like the reforming queen, the pious queen, the one who set the example of what the Reformation could be of people being able to have access to the Bible and people being able to, you know, kind of worship like that. And she wanted to set the standard for that. And so she also knew that there were rumors about her of being the great whore and everything like that. So she knew that she had to embrace the church. Well, and, and just show that she wasn't and, Mm -hmm. you know, say, I'm going to have a court that's the best behaved court ever. So Mm -hmm. you guys want to call me the great whore. Look at my court. My court's amazing. Like above reproach kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. And then was Mary, the daughter of Mm -hmm. Henry and Catherine, was she really sort of defiant like yes. that? I mean, she like... Yes. Yeah. She was. And you're going to see it later. And it, Chapuis said something that... Or no, I think it was Moore said he feared for uh, the daughter Mary's as well. Life. Because yeah. it it drove Anne nuts. Mary was so obstinate. And Anne said she wished that somebody would just poison her and all of that. It was just driving her insane how obstinate Mary was about it. And yeah. even Henry made these blustering things about how he was going to poison her and stuff if she didn't fall into line. And she she didn't. Eventually, she did have to write a letter. She really wanted to be back. After her mother died, she really wanted to be back in his favor and to have her dad. Mm-hmm. And she wrote a letter acknowledging that she was illegitimate and that she was a bastard. And that was the letter that she had to write in order to be back in at court. That's rough. Yeah. So and then the the letter or whatever, the the command or whatever you call it, yeah. um, that the Pope said about, you know, ca- their Catherine and Henry's marriage not being annulled and also that Anne's marriage to Henry was null and void yes. and also that he would face excommunication. Was that a real document or order yes. or whatever it was called yeah he gave he gave a certain amount of time for her for him to for him to like change his mind yep. <laughs> and then after that point yeah he he was excommunicated then wow and yeah like it like it showed in this i mean he kind of didn't care at that point no he, he had already kind of excommunicated himself yeah yeah he was kind of like it it's like, you know well, is this a threat like i don't i'm not a part of you anymore so yeah it He was excommunicated in 1538, so it took, even after Anne Boleyn had died, he wasn't officially excommunicated until a couple of years later. But yeah, he he was. And it's a shame they didn't get a a boy. I know. Well, for them. I know. Yeah. That would have just solved solved everything. And so, and the daughter that they had was Elizabeth? Yes. And that would be like Queen Elizabeth? Yes. And she was a good, great queen? She was amazing, yes. Okay. She defeated the Spanish Armada. Cool. She's the queen that never got married. She's the virgin queen, and she ruled for 45 years. That's a long time. It is. The Gloriana, the golden age of Elizabethan blank. Shakespeare. Yeah. All of that. William Byrd. Nice. Good things happened under Elizabeth. It did. 
the Walter Raleigh and the first colonies. So some something good. Gosh, just so much came out of this. Yeah. Like I mean, the the church, like Protestantism, Elizabeth, Queen Elizabeth. Anne Boleyn had a I mean, huge effect on history, on like the world. Yeah. Like, how it works on our world. Yeah. The Puritan movement that started the yeah. our colonies. Yeah. Came out of that. That's wild. Man. So for a, all of that, a woman who, you know, didn't come from. Well, she came out from the Howard family, but you know, she was just a, a girl. She yeah. had this massive, long-lasting effect. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, those are all my questions. That was fast. Well, thanks for listening. Yeah. Remember that you can learn more about us at watchingthetutors.com and leave us a rating on iTunes. It's a really big help. Yeah, we'd appreciate it. And thank you for listening. And we will we'll be back in about another two weeks. Talk to you next time. All right. Bye. Bye.